It's time for Security Now. Steve is going to blow the lid off the biggest scandal in router configuration ever. It's called buffer bloat, and you probably have it. We'll find out how you can tell and what buffer bloat is next on Security Now. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Audio bandwidth for security now is provided by the new Winamp for Android, featuring wireless sync and one-click iTunes import. Now with free daily music downloads and full-length CD listening parties. Download it for free at winamp.com slash Android. Video bandwidth for security now is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 345, recorded March 21st, 2012. Buffer bloat. Security Now is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, visit netflix.com slash twit. It's time for security now. Get ready. Fasten your seatbelts. It's time to protect yourself and your privacy online with this guy right here, our explainer-in-chief, Mr. Steve Gibson. For 345 episodes, he's been protecting you. Yes, sir. And we have have an explainer episode this week that I think everyone is going to find very interesting. This is something which has actually been at a low simmer for about a year and a half when some of the serious guru designers of the internet began to wonder why their home connections for which they were paying you know a a useful amount of money for x number of megabits didn't seem to be performing as well as they expected Hmm. and these are these are the guys who you know did all of this and something seemed to be wrong it turned out that over time almost as you can you, you could expect, in the same way that we've had hard drives getting inexorably bigger and processors getting inexorably faster, RAM prices have been inexorably falling. And manufacturers of routers just began putting more RAM in them. In, in the same way that you cannot buy a small hard drive anymore, you know, like hundreds of megs you used to be able to that used to be big you can't even buy a few gig now similarly you can't buy a little bit of ram you always get a a, a <laughs> well a, a bloat load a bloat uh, load <laughs> a bloat load <laughs> so what's happened is our our routers have large buffers and it turns out that's not good you would think, oh, you know, that's good because then you won't drop packets. But we're going to look in detail at why the Internet needs short buffers, how its entire design has been based on on small buffers and low latency, which small buffers deliver, and how this sort of silent bloating of buffers, th- buffering throughout the Internet is is already causing problems. Uh, we've got a cool way for people to determine whether they're bloated or not and to what degree, um, and even some things that adventurous people can do. So I think a great podcast. Wow. Yeah, yeah I mean, well, actually, uh, I, I first heard the phrase buffer bloat not so long ago on a triangulation. We had Bram Cohen, the creator of BitTorrent, on. And uh, he, uh, because he's doing BitTorrent Live, which we are on, we were part of their uh, launch partnership um he learned a lot about streaming media and the problem of buffer bloat and then he pointed to to an article by vint surf which he said well they kind of got it wrong but he had a lot of you know uh empirical uh information about buffer bloat and well and one of the things one, one, one of the things that the torrent clients have recently started trying to do is is to be better citizens right. on the internet right because their nature was to cause this bloat which would for example collapse voip or regular web surfing just didn't they just there was no 
this this notion of fair treatment of different flows right. where flows are are like you know we've discussed connections before um you unless you're very careful with that it's difficult to guarantee that and what's really interesting is even reading the the most recent dialogues among these super bright people they don't really have the answer so there's also an aspect of this which i find fascinating which is there isn't a good answer to this problem hmm it's re it's really interesting i mean the best minds have been scratching their heads thinking okay what's a universal answer the, the one of the problems is that we have such a incredibly heterogeneous environment you know made up of all kinds of different stuff many different link speeds many different architectures the nature of the internet is to just be glued together with these autonomous routers which bounce packets from one place to another so there's no way of knowing for example what the round trip delay will be between you and the place you're trying to connect to and back again it doesn't even have to be the same in each direction because as we know packets can travel different routes in different directions so this incredible freedom that we have thanks to the, this cool design of the internet does create problems so we're going to cover that in detail this week and i know you want to talk a little bit about your ipad but before you do i do want a little coffee a little bit of a coffee thing okay because yesterday we had a very well known computer programmer on Rich Siegel, who's at Bare Bones Software, and he told me about the black blood of the earth. <laughs> and I have ordered some, and I will give you a, a report on this. You might be interested in this. The black blood of the earth is a coffee that is, uh, well, it's kind of a coffee extract. It's a cold extract uh, using a vacuum. You Now, for $40, you get 750 milliliters of this stuff. So it's concentrated. Highly. He says that he like recommends tar. keeping it below 100 milliliters a day. Uh, you've well, got I mean, about... Your, your own consumption. Yes. He says you've got about a <laughs> month and a half worth of caffeine by Starbucks Venti's in a single bottle. Oh. So you could actually probably put yourself into fibrillation with this stuff. Yeah. Uh, but I have ordered it. He says the the reason he started doing it, the guy is a uh, radiation specialist at uh, Berkeley. And uh, and he also spends a lot of time at uh, Amundsen Station in the South Pole. But he um, apparently needs coffee, but he's a diabetic, and he can't drink cream and sugar. So he wanted to create a coffee brew that didn't have the acidity of regular coffee. By cold extracting using a vacuum, apparently none of the acids are extracted, just the oils, the flavor, the caffeine. And uh, so he, he and it's slightly sweet, he says, because there is a little bit of sweetness in the bean. And when you don't have the, when you don't have the acids, okay. black black blood of the earth. Is it's that a what you're telling me? Uranium labs. Anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna I've ordered a sampler. Okay. <laughs> and a and a black stein blood. of science, black blood of the earth. Oh goodness. And uh, <laughs> this guy is pretty serious about it. We will uh, we will uh, we will as soon as it arrives, I will give you because he does single bean. Uh, extracts, you know, so he's really, he's kind of, you know, there's a Guatemalan, a Colombian, there's a Rwandan, there's one called Death Wish I didn't really want to try. Um, so stay tuned. <laughs> wow. Um, I ran across a crazy inventor decades ago Yeah. Uh, who, and I don't remember what the project was, I was consulting for some company and so they found this inventor guy and he was like showing us his stuff and he had designed a camera which you mounted on the underbelly of a plane yeah. and flew into a hurricane and this could this thing somehow was had spinning mirrors that could synchronize with the instantaneous wind velocity to take photographs of hailstones in as they're being formed <laughs> wow so and he says oh and by the way i have the best coffee in the world and and so of course that caught my attention yeah, because yeah you know i'm, I'm a little more even always than looking always looking yeah, yeah. exactly and this his, his deal was the same thing he took i don't remember the details now but it was cold i remember it was all about cold water cold extraction yeah. 
and something like he took a a whole uh you know uh uban canister like you buy at the supermarket you know like the large tin and he did something with it like maybe he just poured cold water in it or something i don't remember now what what the detail was but you know then let 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 it sat and then he did he definitely extracted this syrup from the result yeah. and that was like his magic potion and then he would he would mix he would take a taste a tablespoon or two of that in a cup add hot water and it made like this amazingly zero bitter coffee right that right he loved it also doesn't and stain your also, teeth because the acid could, etches your teeth <laughs> and it could melt hailstones like no <laughs> there is a company uh, the chat room has given me uh, a link to toddy t-o-d-d-y a cold brew coffee system Mm. So I'll order that too, and I'll let you. <laughs> of course, you will. Welcome once again to Coffee Talk, a subsidiary of the hey, Gibson at least Research we're Corporation. Recording this time, we started the recorder. <laughs> so as long as we're off on a tangent, I guess I have to I, I ask you how. So you, how many iPads did you get? Two, Two. one four uh, G LTE because I'm grandfathered in to the original AT and T unlimited bandwidth for twenty nine ninety five. And so one question I had was whether they were going to honor that with, you know, whether they would still honor unlimited 4G LTE bandwidth that everybody is saying is faster than Wi-Fi in, you know, if you get, you know, like standing under the tower and in the right, in the right circumstances. Um, when I went from the iPad 1 to the iPad 2, I moved the SIM card and that's all that was necessary. And the the iPad 2 then thought it was on the same account as the old one. Well, I tried to play the same game this time. I did note that they were different colors and looked very different. The, the iPad 3 SIM card and the iPad 2, sure enough, I swapped them and neither of the iPads were happy with their new SIM card. So I put them back and then poked around and essentially moving the account was as easy as logging in to that AT&T account through the control panel on the iPad 3 and it showed me my different plans and the one that was chosen is one no one else can choose anymore but that's the unlimited for 29.95 and it it that one was the one was that was selected and it stayed selected and it left me where I was so huh. you know so migrating was easy um I the, I've been a big fan of anti-glare, as you know, yes. anti-glare film. And so I've left one without the anti-glare film and one with. And so my overall take is that the iPad 2 is fine. You know, I mean, it, it does everything you want. The iPad 3 is, is a constant surprise with how clear it is. It's just... When I look at it, I'm like, wow, this and this is clear. Now, I know that will fade because I had that original same sort of a feeling with the first e-ink where it looked like it was just printed yeah. on, the, on, the, on the screen. It didn't really look like it was real. It looked like you know, a store demo where you have to peel that film off before you actually can use it. Um, and, and, you know, for, that lasted for a couple of months where I'd look at it and just kind of marvel at this <laughs> e-ink technology. It's like, wow, this is neat. You know, it doesn't look like an LCD at all. So now I have the same thing with the iPad 3. I mean, it is really clear. But, you know, people have said, well, I have an iPad 2 and I like it. Do I need to upgrade? And I would say, eh, no, probably not. Um, there has been some inter interesting controversy that you've probably heard, Leo. We know that the batteries have been, somehow they squeezed substantially more watt hours into what is essentially the same size. If I if I put them both on the uh, lay them both flat on the table, I don't see that the iPad three is really any thicker than the iPad two. No, it does feel millimeter. heavier. Yeah, it's, yeah, it feels tiny. heavier. Yeah, um, but the iPad two had twenty five watt hours of total battery, whereas the iPad three has forty three point eight watt hours. So. From 25 to 43, that's that's a, a substantial change yeah. in terms of, of terms of energy density. And the first thing that I thought when I saw the 
the iFixit teardown was, ooh, that's going to be slower to charge. And sure enough, that's one of the things that we're seeing now, sir, uh, you know, being being noticed on the internet is people who do run their iPad all the way down. It takes it takes a long time to charge it back up because those little chargers are two and a half watts and two amps. And so if you're if you're charging a forty a dead an empty forty three to round it easily watt hour battery with two and a half watts. You do the math, and it's you know it's actually the iPad adapter is ten watts. Okay, um, but still two amps, I guess. Yeah, I think it's only two amps. Yeah, um, so um, uh, it's going to take hours it's in order slow. to charge it. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's what we are we are seeing. And then lastly, the last glitch that I just just saw was that the uh, uh, problem with some people's smart covers with the iPad three, because the iPad two had magnet sensors that did not care about the the polarity the north south polarity of the magnets and the problem was people who folded their original iPad 2 covers back sometimes had their iPad think that the cover was closed over the front of it rather than being all the way opened over the back of it and so Apple fixed that little glitch by making the iPad 3s cover sensor magnets sensitive to north versus south so that it could tell whether the magnet was coming down from above or up from below. But the problem is that some of the original covers were not, and, and third-party covers that also take advantage of this, were they had their magnets thrown in with no concern for their north-south orientation. So... What that means is that some will work and some won't. It's just sort of luck of the draw. And apparently Apple is now taking back pa uh, um, covers that don't work and exchanging them for ones that do because as soon as uh, when Apple fixed this problem, they had to start oriented the magnets in their covers correctly. So anyway, that's my iPad 3 trivia. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I have noticed that on some of my covers, although Apple's smart covers, of course, are correct polarity. Yep, yep. Um, in security news, there's two things, uh, both from one guy. I've got a, a, a sort of a past friend, a current friend, and a hacker named Jeremy Kolake, who I'm sure I've mentioned uh, in podcasts before. He actually helped me with one part of the socket lock utility that I wrote. He's adept with uh, drivers and um uh, and so he was able to quickly produce one component of that little gizmo when, when we were locking raw sockets back in those days. Anyway, he discovered something looking we – we, actually, this, is, this sort of follows nicely on last week's discussion about uh, server configuration and, and security. Um, he discovered that Apache servers by default have something called a mod status module installed – and running. And so, for example, if you go to www.washingtonpost.com slash server hyphen status, that's a pseudo page generated by this, this status module, which gives you a real time snapshot into the server. Now, the problem is that l these Apache servers are all over the place, and you can see a list of the most recent URLs which have been served. And as we know, URLs often contain sensitive data, and these will be URLs even if they were wrapped in SSL. This is, at once it gets to the server, after it's been decrypted, these mod stat, the, the, this server hyphen status page will show you potentially confidential information. And so anyway, Jeremy blogged about this. Uh, he has his, his blog is thepileof.blogspot.com, if anyone is curious. And, I mean, even Apache.org has their server status page wide open. And, a, and I don't want to go to, into any other organizations that do, but some very sensitive organizations with running Apache server, you can see 
the the IP addresses of the people who have been visiting and what URLs they clicked on. And just like, whoa. So, uh, and as far as I know, Jeremy is the only person who has noticed this and and talked about it. So he asked me if I would bring it to our listeners' attention. Anybody who is an Apache server admin, you may want to, unless you're explicitly serving that server hyphen status page to the outside world for, for some reason, uh, you may want to lock that down. These things can happen, as as we know. And then the second point is many people have asked and been excited about the encrypted DNS service being offered by OpenDNS. And until, actually, I guess even now, the client side, in order to use encrypted DNS, you need to be making encrypted queries of the OpenDNS server. There wasn't a Windows client, but Jeremy found the one that was currently available, I think over on, um, on Google code and checked it out and tried it. And it looks like it works great. So his most recent blog entry again at the pile of dot blog com is how to, how to use and configure the windows client for issuing encrypted DNS. And you know, and the reason this is of interest, I mean, all, I'm sure our listeners will understand this. We've all talked about the the utility uh, and growing need to encrypt our TCP connections, but there is no encryption of DNS. It's not available. It's not offered. It's not in the spec. There's There's no equivalent of making an encrypted DNS query, which means anyone who's looking, for example, at even at someone's encrypted traffic in an open Wi-Fi hotspot will still see all their DNS queries, meaning that they know all the domains that they're looking up. And while this is not a huge problem, um, it is a, it's an information disclosure problem. And I've had, I've apparently there's enough interest that I've seen some people asking questions and, and tweeting me asking me if I've seen and what I think about the open DNS encrypted DNS stuff. So it is available on um, Linux, Mac, and Unix, and there is the Windows client that Jeremy says works just great that's uh, now available also for download. So you can find out more about that at thepileof.blogspot.com. Then in just yesterday's news, actually I guess the last couple of days, um, the, it came to light that the NSA... I don't know if you ran across this bit of news, Leo, is building a massive, super, super computer center in Utah with big cooling towers, huge water pumps to pump the water through the cooling towers to take the heat out of this place, its own energy generation system, uh, you know, all of the, I mean, this is going to be a top secret NSA cyber computation facility and the concern was uh, naturally among people who listen to the podcast uh oh does that mean that the nsa will be developing the technology to crack state-of-the-art encryption and uh, so i thought well okay i'm still not worried because because 256 bit aes is so already overkill stronger than we need i mean 64-bit is arguably strong. 128-bit, as we know, is is not twice as strong with the bits being twice as long. It's, it's, it's well, you know, 64 bits is going to be twice 32 bits. So 32 bits we know is 4 billion. That means that 64 bits is going to be 16 billion billion, which means that... Only 128 bits will be 256 billion, 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 billion. That's just 128 bits. And we, you know, we keep going, you know, multiplying for every one bit we add. So I'm not worried about 256-bit AES encryption, which is now available. I would say that's what I would recommend. But what was really interesting is that the NSA has apparently all kinds of different satellites, literally and figuratively, of the NSA 
are feeding into this center and they have an, an amazing amount of storage. And one of the things that one of the articles that I saw about this mentioned was that they're very interested in decrypting the foreign community, the encrypted foreign communications from years past, which was still using less strong encryption. So it's not so much that they, that we have a concern today. Um, it's that, and, and, and what I loved about this was it brings up a really important lesson for us. And that is that while our current encrypted data may not be crackable today, it may be crackable a hundred years from now. And the NSA has been storing encrypted communications globally for a long time and archiving it. Even though they couldn't crack it, they figured one of these days maybe we will be able to. So this facility that they're building is more designed at cracking the past than it is cracking now and the future because, frankly, now and the future is really, really strong. You know, we've got seriously strong technology. But even a decade ago, there was stuff they would de they would dearly love to crack. And a decade ago, our encryption was not nearly as strong as it is today. So, so that's an interesting lesson that, you know, they've, they're just these massive stockpilers and archivers of global communications that they don't know what they say yet. But once this facility is in place and humming, <laughs> probably literally from miles away and glowing at night, um, that's the, the project they're going to be on is, is seeing, you know, bringing to bear insane computing power in order to to peer in back into encrypted data that uh, is still opaque, which I think is kind of cool. There was a story that I didn't have a chance to plow into. Um, another one of these Wi-Fi alliance things where, where um, somehow our cell phones are going to be authenticating to wireless hotspots. And so it's not clear. That no, there's no technical information yet. I did dig de as deep as I could, and all it was was a press release saying that due to the, the proliferation of wireless hotspots um, and, of course, the wireless, the, the cellular carrier um, preference for moving their customers to to ground based wi-fi rather than co than competing for limited cellular bandwidth you can sort of see that the cellular providers would like to somehow get their customers moved over you know for example you know the ipad is you know mine is at&t and wi-fi and when i'm somewhere where there's a wi-fi access point that i have acknowledged and, and logged into, the, the iPad will preferentially use that bandwidth over using cellular. So there's a there's some movement afoot to make this official. And um, it's still premature. I'll keep my eye out for it. And if any if any of my t Twitter followers uh, see any more details, by all means give me a heads up so that I can can look into it. But um, you know one hopes that whatever it is they do, they do correctly. And it would be neat, for example, if there was some sort of you know, encrypted negotiation so that you were able to seamlessly encrypt your connection to a Wi-Fi hotspot rather than, I don't know, you know, join it in some fashion without the advantage of encryption. So that would be nice because you know, your your cellular connection is always encrypted, whereas you know, any, as we know, any use of Wi-Fi hotspots is just not at all. So, and then there was another story that I was unable to track any more details down. Um, maybe you ran across this, Leo. Um, the RIAA and the MPAA were at a conference two days ago and saying that by June, 
like just like June 1st was the date that was quoted. So just a few months from now, ISPs are going to be watching their users' behavior on behalf of copyright holders and for the first time ever are implementing infrastructure, which is what it takes on the ISP side, to start sending notifications to their to their customers if they see them downloading copyrighted material. First they get it they get a couple notices first and and a few strikes and then your bandwidth gets throttled and then ultimately you get disconnected. So, you know, that's news to have ISPs which, you know, to this point have just been blind bandwidth carriers of ours. I mean, they've been doing some shaping. We know that they've been caught you know, trying to throttle things that they thought were using too much bandwidth, but they weren't doing any looking at our traffic. So this is a concern. Now, the good news is SSL is our friend because they can't, they can't filter and look into any of our SSL connections and they can't proxy them unless they start making us accept a browser certificate, which, you know, will be the end of life as we know it. Um, so, you know, none of that is apparently happening. But for people who are not using SSL, um, a few months from now, the word is that and there, there's like it's a whole lineup of like a bunch of the major ISPs are saying they're going to start being proactive. Yeah, so, this, is, uh, this is that six strikes. That's the one. Yes. Rule. Um, AT&T, Verizon, Comcast, Cablevision and Time Warner. It's a voluntary agreement. It's not a legal, it's right. not, a, not a law. Uh, but, uh, but, but why, I mean, like, you know, we're their customer. Why are they s- serving the interests of, of the RIA and the MPAA who, you know, are doing everything they can to, to mess things up? You know, the article that I found is, is eight months old. So I don't know if, if this has changed, but at the, at, at this point, uh, the ISPs say we will forward copyright notices to subscribers, but we won't turn over information about subscribers without a court order. It's a one-way street. Yes, as far as I know, that is still the case. Yeah. Based on what I saw that talked about uh, what was just being said two days ago, right. this would be ISP to their customer. Not, and I didn't mean in all, in any way to assume or to imply that data is going from the ISP back to the copyright holder. Now, I, I what don't, happens after five or six alerts, which is quite a few, is the ISPs have agreed to, ins- to institute mitigation um, based on the copyright holder's requests, uh, which could include temporary reduction of Internet speeds, throttling, redirection to a landing page until the subscriber contacts the ISP to discuss the matter, Mm. or responds to some educational information about copyright or other measures the ISP may deem necessary to help resolve the matter. There, they, this does not involve a disconnect at any point from the uh, from Internet service. But throttling can be pretty a pretty serious penalty. Yeah, and then, so now we, we come to the question, what constitutes copyrighted material? You know how how does that determination made? Well, it's and, it's a letter from the copyright holder, and I have to say this system is very broken uh, in a number of ways. For instance, YouTube, which you know has this DMCA okay. takedown, uh, I am now getting a notice on almost every show we post that we contain content from, and it's it's people we de- definitely don't contain content from Brazilian. Uh, often Brazilian broadcasters, just strange. And I think uh, what's happened is these these, there's, these these people are gaming YouTube now, so that they are they are saying, well, you know, they're giving them something, and it sets up a, it's all automatic at YouTube's end. And what it does is it, al- it, it allows these guys to put ads into my content because uh, YouTube gives you a choice. YouTube says, well, we'll take it down. Uh, or you could put an ad in, or you can offer to sell the content if it's a song or whatever. And so what these these Brazilian television stations are doing, I think they're doing this as a gaming uh, thing, but I haven't really done much digging, is putting ads on our content. Uh, so they're, they're getting a false, I think they're getting a false copyright false. notice. Yeah. And then getting the right to put an ad in our content. It's just, it's a- appalling. And so you can see how... 
this kind of copyright notification system can be absolutely abused. Well, exactly. And that was my point was that the ISPs are adding automated systems. So, for example, in order to, to, to send out notices and to count how many they've sent and not only and including to actually actively filter the the queries that their customers are sending out to the Internet in order to retrieve the, what is believed to be copyrighted content. That all this is all new infrastructure. This is some serious equipment that the ISPs are for some reason installing and sticking in the circuit of their customers in order to offer this service as such as it is such as it is. But the question is then where where is the list of what is copyrighted right. coming from? Their filters have to be driven by a blacklist of uh, I don't the, think the these, ISPs are doing this. I, I, isn't it the copyright holders are notifying the ISPs? But like what? Of every file on the internet? You see what I mean? Copyright, it's gotta, here's what it says. Copyright holders will scan the net for infringement. Okay. Grabbing uh, suspect IP, or IP addresses from peer-to-peer -peer file sharing networks. BitTorrent, if you're not, if you're not smart, <laughs> for instance, well, you can see who's, who's sharing it. If you're smart, you just encrypt and that doesn't happen. But if but so if they see your IP address participating, they'll they'll then contact that ISP. The ISP, by the way, this is better than the old procedure, which was they would ask the ISP for information. And the ISP might actually give it to them. Now the ISPs say, no, we're not going to give you any information. We'll notify them and we'll do the six strikes thing. Um, so I think it's just a, a formalized agreement about what will happen. But the, I mean, the copyright holders have been doing this for ages. This is the only no, way see, they but, can do that. Yeah, but no, see, but this is different. That's uh, what you're talking about is what has been happened, where IPs were identified as being infringing, and then the ISPs could notify their customers. Now, the ISP has some sort of blacklist of of content, not not of customers, but of content. So if a if one of their customers downloads that content the isp says oh that's copyrighted content and so my question is where does that list come from that seems to be the real problem because that so so the because the isp has to be able to identify customer queries that are attempting to fetch copyrighted material from the internet not not by customer but by the you know the 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 name of the material in the URL, and so there's there's got to be a list of that somehow, that that the ISPs yeah. filters trip on. I don't see that on the original article. Here's an article uh, from Law the Law and Disorder column a couple of days ago in uh, Ars Technica. Um, the copyright alert system. Um, I. The, everything I've seen says that it is still incumbent upon not the ISPs but the copyright holders to notify the ISPs. So I, I'm trying to find that information. So you're saying that the ISPs have now running some sort of filtering. My understanding was of that. Maybe that's not the case, though. Maybe, maybe it's just that they're they're maintaining this six strike counter and being more proactive in what they do with their customers and. Um, um, it just you know there just isn't enough information yet about what this thing is. I did I did want to bring it up because it it popped onto my radar. And yeah, I, knew that I don't our blame listeners. you. I mean, <laughs> here's the uh, here's the uh, probably the one you saw, which was from the panel. Um, yes. Uh, each ISP has developed their infrastructure for automating the system. Start date for traffic. Uh, Major labels monitor BitTorrent and peer-to-peer -peer networks for copyright infringement, then report that infringement to ISPs. Okay. So it is the labels doing the ISP. I really think that this agreement is the ISPs trying to get out from under this. Not, you know, the, uh, they are set up a system, but it's, it's so that they don't have to do anything more. Well, and it does sound like it, it's, the, it's a benefit to customers because the ISPs are, will not be turning over the customer's identities to then be brought up for the in, the, in these ridiculous exactly. lawsuits that we've exactly. covered. Exactly, unless there's a subpoena. So these yeah. ridiculous lawsuits are all John Doe suits, which then are, the point is to get the court to go to the ISP saying, okay, hand over that information.
and compel them and yep. compel them. And I think that this is the ISP saying, look, why, let's just do it this way. <laughs> and not let's not go to court. And frankly, I think the record holders, the record industry and the and the motion picture industry are looking for a way to save face and to back down on all these John Doe court cases. You know, I think that's right too, Leo, because I do remember reading something about, you know, about like a pro forma letter that said um, so individuals at the account associated with your right, uh, right. Uh, with the IP address of your account have downloaded copyrighted materials. So so this probably represents a an interface between the the copyright holders who are still responsible for generating IP lists of of misbehavior and then those they turn over to the to the ISPs managing those IPs and then it's the I, and then the ISPs now ha are taking a new role in notifying the customers right. who have those exactly. IPs. And there is an appeal process. This is, I think, a way to avoid a three strikes law. Yeah, which good. which nobody wants except no. the except the copyright holders. <laughs> right. Um, I did want to just mention that I finished book thirteen of the Honor Harrington series. Actually, there's probably one or two more coming. Um, I'm glad that I read them. Um, I have this. This whole new world exists in me now. <laughs> uh, After the honor, novels. honor verse, right? Isn't that what they call uh, it? Yeah, the honor verse, and uh, it, it 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 wrapped up at a nice place. I'm not I'm not chomping at the bit for fourteen and fifteen. David can I mean thirteen just came out like this month earlier this month, so it just happened. So I imagine I'll wait a year or two for for fourteen, and I'll read that, and fifteen, and I'll read that. There are other ancillary books but i'm not going off and down those rat holes because I've, I've had all i can handle with 13 and as i mentioned last week i'm excited now to start reading more about nutrition which is my uh current reading focus i so, uh, i got a very nice uh, email from somebody who pointed me to gary taub's blog post about that harvard meat study ah in which he blows it out of the water Mm. And I had forgotten. I had read, you know, Good Calories, Bad Calories, which is the book I know that you you you're taking as gospel. And he in blows it out of the water there too. These this this uh, these epide epidemiological studies. Yes, that's uh, the problem that our entire entire nutrition system is based on now. Uh, yes, they've gained such currency, and it's really very simple. It's funny. I posed this question to my daughter, who uh, studied. Uh, has studied statistics and 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 she's actually taken a course at her university called Citizen Science, which is about educating non scientists and scientific thought so that they can more intelligently nice. judge things like this. And I said, nice. Abby, what's wrong with this study? They took a hundred thousand physicians and they uh, followed them for eighteen years, giving them the questionnaire about what they ate and then checked their mortality. And according to the study, they had a twenty percent chance higher chance of dying prematurely if they ate meat. What's wrong with that study? And she cut through it right away. I was really impressed. She said, well, the problem is for those past 18 years, we've been told that eating meat is bad for you. So the core cohort of physicians who are eating less or no meat are probably also people who take better care of themselves in other ways. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Since we've been told eating meat is bad, yeah, people very who don't good, eat Abby. meat are going to be more likely to take good care of themselves correlation does not prove causality and exactly I said, a plus abby laporte you get <laughs> a check mark on your quiz yep in fact you you and i may remember you, you you may remember that you and i a long time ago we were talking about the problem of tracking down causality and we, and we were i think we used the analogy of an alien landing in new york and noticing that when the rain came down, everyone opened their umbrellas. And <laughs> that unless, you know, unless you understood, exactly, <laughs> it, unless you understood what, what the actual mechanism was, right. you could easily draw the wrong conclusion. And that's why we have scientific process. That's why, that's why the scientific method exists. Because as yeah. Tobbs points this out, okay, now you have a theory. That's all you have. Now you actually have to test, and this is what's so difficult. Well, does meat actually cause mortality? We maybe have a theory based on this epidemiological study, but you have no information. So now you create a scientific, a, a double-blind study, and then we'll know. But, of course, and nobody's doing double-blind studies with meat eaters. Well, actually, the problem is 
that dietary studies are notoriously difficult, difficult yeah. because you don't know about the level of compliance that the people actually have to the diet. And we're talking about problems that manifest over decades. And that's, I mean, that's the real problem is very difficult. We're, yeah. we're really not good about about anything that takes that period of time. He says, and he does quote in the book, both books, uh, Good Calories, Bad Calories, and his kind of more popularized... Why uh, we get fat. Why we get fat. He talks about a study that was done on uh, all the popular diets and those who followed closely each diet and the prognosis for each. And uh, oddly enough, counterintuitively, Atkins won against the Zone diet, against the Pritikin diet, Dean Ornish's diet. Um, and he says that's the only evidence we have. So anyway, yeah. you were right. Yeah. I, I brought it up unthinking. Fortunately, my daughter has a better head than I do. And I well, read no. the blog post from Gary Tobbs, which was just well done. Well, and in fact, at the end of the first part of good calories, bad calories, and I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to start that from the beginning because I I took a break from Honor Harrington just because this sort of came on my radar and it ap immediately captured my attention. The book I'm reading currently is one on nutritional anthropology, which is really interesting. Um, but but the point is, at the end of the first section, where where Gary talks about how it is that we our society came to believe that that fat is bad for us that a low fat higher carb diet is is heart smart or heart healthy it it turns out that there's one guy that's responsible for this and he doctored his data yep. um uh Ansel Keys is his name um since no longer with us um and but but at the end of that in a beautiful short paragraph, Gary explains the fundamental impossibility of using epidemiological processes for diet to, to determine dietary outcomes. And and w when I encounter that again, I'll, I'll I'll share it because it was very short and just it was just spot on. So thank you. In interesting stuff. Yeah. Um, my news is that I've moved to Firefox. Version 11. Wow, Stephen. You're... From 3 to 11. <laughs> That's quite a jump. <laughs> <laughs> they have solved the memory problems. So I wanted to let everyone know that my big complaint was that, you know, that, that t 8 and 9 and 10 kept saying, oh, we're better about memory, we're better about memory. They've, it's solved now. It, you close pages and you get back the memory that those pages were taking, which is the first this is the first version of Firefox since they broke it a long time ago that that's been true for. And what, what really what was my final motivation was that I wanted to be able to turn on Speedy in Firefox, which is available in version 11. You need to go to using version 11 because it's not on by default. You go to about colon config. You put about colon config in the URL. That brings up a pseudo config page. Then in the search term up at the top, there, there's a search field. Just type in SPDY. And that'll that'll find you that set of that subset of configuration um, settings involving the SPDY, the so-called speedy protocol, and it'll be turned off by default. Just double click it and flip it back on or flip it on and you then have speedy support in Firefox and there is um, a an add-on which will show when you are using speedy connections as you surf around the web um, but also while you're in that about config um, if you type in cookie c-o-o-k-i-e you'll be taken to a bunch of lines involving cookies. And there's an interesting setting that I did some research on after I found it. It's only, And you can turn that on. And people who are concerned about tracking and would like more prevention of that, sort of just generically, um, you, this, this makes third-party cookies session only so that when you... When you close the page for a website, the, the third-party cookies that may have been transacted and in some cases have to be in order to use 
things like you know some fire uh, some Facebook apps require third party cookies. Some someone told me that some Google services now won't function because Google is using their own third party domains for to to glue their things together. So you have to have third party cookies enabled. So you can make them just session only. You close the page and they're never written to disk and they just go away. So that's another nice little feature that's probably been in Firefox for a while, but I just happened to put in cookie. I was searched I searched for that when I was searching for speedy because I wanted to turn that on. And lastly, just a complete randomness, um I wanted to find good wallpaper for my my super high density, high definition screen on my iPad 3. And I was reminded of one of my favorite websites. I, I became a lifelong member years ago called digitalblasphemy.com. And this is a guy who for a decade has been using all of the, I mean, a huge array of, of digital artwork creation tools to generate really beautiful scenes, um, scenes of nature, castles in the background with, with lakes and trees in front of them and snow in the distance, um, complete abstracts, neurons firing, and, and all of this wow. is available at very high resolution. Um, I mean, w like full desktop, large monitor resolution. He also has dual and triple monitor versions so that you could have your wallpaper stretch out over a three monitor setup and rather than have it repeat or you know have it all be coherent so anyway i just wanted to tip our listeners off to digitalblasphemy.com it's a great site oh, yeah. um there's stuff that's available for free you can join for a year i i joined for life because I always wanted access to it, and it's been worthwhile. He keeps generating new stuff every year, so uh, it, uh, that that lifetime subscription ended up being useful. And I like to support someone who's doing that stuff. I mean, really beautiful, beautiful yeah. artwork. Yeah, he does great stuff. Yeah. Um, and I heard from a listener, um, Ken Harthen, who wrote to me on the nineteenth of February. Spinrite saves a student's laptop. He said, Steve. I'm a loyal listener of Security Now, having listened to every single episode. That first episode was only 18 minutes and left me wanting more. Well, we've taken Was care it of that. that short? Wow. Wow. And that was your original concept, Leo, was just to do it's sort a quickie, of a huh? check in <laughs> on the week. Yeah. I was like, okay, well, that didn't last long. <laughs> uh, it's funny, too, because I remember that, you know, Elaine quoting me for transcription didn't sound like it was going to be very expensive either. So, no, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> oh, it's been worthwhile, and I, I has, haven't looked you. back. Thank you. Uh, so he said today's episode was a little over two hours and still left me wanting more. You are often the source and inspiration for my Security Corner blog posts over at IT Knowledge Exchange. So, a big geek thank you to you and Leo. Please continue. He says, I first used Spinrite in 1999. That was version 5.0 to recover a floppy disk that had been corrupted. Since that day, I've insisted that wherever I worked, the IT department agree to make Spinrite available to me should the need arise. And too often it has. In my, pra in my private service world, I always insist that if Spinrite recovers the drive for my client, that my client purchase a copy. Needless to say, there have been a few sales as a result. That's a good idea. I, That's a good way to do it. And I have no yeah. problem with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, he says, I have my own copy, of course. And last summer, I insisted that my new employer, um, Antonelli College, where I am the network administrator, purchase a site license. Well, that's a good thing, because last week it saved one of their students' laptops and all of her interior design coursework. Windows was throwing all kinds of errors. The wireless wouldn't connect. She gave me a list of seemingly random errors that didn't seem to make a whole lot of sense, but they pointed toward a hard drive failure. I was about to attempt to back up the data and restore the system when it just completely locked up, and I had to force a shutdown with the power button. On restart, it just hung at the starting window screen and would go no further. I could hear the drive thrashing about. Not good. Enter Spinrite. I booted up to my I booted up from my thumb drive and ran it at level two. 
After a couple of hours, Spinrite reported that it was finished, though no errors or bad sectors were found, which, of course, is a story we've heard many times. Uh, and I've explained why. That doesn't mean Spinrite didn't do anything. He says, on reboot, the system came right up faster than ever, connected to the wireless, and immediately began downloading updates. I completed the updates, ran a few tests, and pronounced the patient healthy. Needless to say, the student was ecstatic. And thanks to Spinrite, I did my part to provide a, quote, superior student experience, unquote. <laughs> he says, par part of our vision statement for the, for the campus. He said, Steve, Spinrite is absolutely the best hard drive maintenance and recovery utility on the planet and maybe in the universe. It's worth 10 times the price you charge for it. Thanks for all you do, Ken Harlton. And he said, P.S., I've never had a hard drive failure, and I attribute that to my using Spinrite on my own systems on a regular basis. And, of course, we understand also why it is a good preventive maintenance utility. L running it on a drive, even a quick level one, shows the drive where it's got problems developing that it's able to correct before they get critical. Hey, before we get critical and talk about buffer bloat, oh, it's a buffer neat topic. bloat. Let me mention briefly Netflix. Netflix.com slash twit. You could try it free for 30 days. Let me get the right lower third on here if I could find it. There it is. For 30 days by visiting uh, Netflix.com slash twit. It's a $7.99 value. Of course, most of you are already subscribing to Netflix streaming, but if you are not or you know somebody who's not, I, my Abby, who was, I told you, very smart, told me the other day, this is the best deal in television, and I agree. For less than 8 bucks a month, look at all the great stuff you can watch. Tens of thousands of movies and TV shows. Uh, all five seasons of Friday Night Lights, if I can make a recommendation, if you haven't watched that yet, it is beautiful, beautiful, beautiful show. Top Gear, seasons 2 through 17, that's a lot of uh, Top Gear. Yeah, the original, the Jeremy Clarkson uh, Top Gear. It, 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 MI5, I mean, Chinatown, The Graduate, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, the original Swedish version, which is amazing, and on and on and on. And the new Lillehammer, which is a Netflix commissioned production, one of the first they're going to do a lot more, is brilliant with uh, Stevie, little Stevie, uh, Steve Van Zandt. Oh, I just am adoring it. Netflix, oh, and I just, I just, I'm still in the middle of watching a documentary about the Eames the designers of the Eames chair, Charles and Ray Eames. I just love this stuff. Netflix.com slash twit. Watch on almost anything, your Blu-ray, your TV, your Roku, your PlayStation 3, your Xbox 360, your Nintendo Wii. I'd go on and on. I'm sure you have Netflix on one of your devices. I have it on all my devices, my Apple TV, everything. Give it a try. Free for 30 days. Netflix.com slash twit. All right, Steve. What is buffer bloat? Okay, our our listeners who are live can start something up in the background while we're talking so that when we get down to where we're talking about what this is, they may have some results. I've done it already, um, and I have my results. Cool. This is episode 345 of Security Now. So I've done what I've done before, which is create a bit.ly link with the episode number bit.ly slash sn345. bit.ly slash sn345. Yep. Uh, and I, I made it both uppercase sn and lowercase sn Good. so that it didn't matter which people used this time. That will take you to a the, the what's called the netalizer, which has been put together by the um, ICSI at berkeley.edu, at UC Berkeley. That's the International Computer Science Institute. It is a Java applet. And I tweeted this link in preparation for the podcast earlier this morning and got some of our listeners who sent back, Steve, that's Java. What's happened to you? <laughs> You're running Java? It's like, yes, yes, we have no choice. I mean, we, so I got a couple of people say, well, I'll install it just for this because it sounds really interesting, but then I'm uninstalling it. It's like, okay, fine. You know, I mean, we are, we're losing this battle against scripting. So I'm accepting that, that, you know, scripting is the future. The beauty of this application in Java, this is a, this is a stunning piece of work. 
And when I'm looking at what they can do in Java, I'm thinking, ooh, I, <laughs> I could do some amazing stuff, which has the benefit of being platform agnostic, which is really important. Being able to do low-level, packet-level work on a, on a, you know, and writing it once and being able to run it across platforms. Of course, it won't run on an iPad. Uh, you need to have something that will run Java, and the iPad won't in the same way that it won't, won't, won't run Flash. But you do get both Mac and PC. So, yes, this is a Java applet. Um, let it run. It takes a few minutes, maybe five minutes. And there is one of the things it does is measure the size of your buffers. That is the ah. un under load, the latency of that the buffering between you and them has. And by the way, we uh, have killed the site. So people go later. Don't go, you know, everybody went all at the same time. And oh, we killed. Oh, the you site. mean we killed Berkeley? Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh. Berkeley.edu is down, my friends. <laughs> Actually, when I tweeted it, that happened. Yeah. Uh, and I even tweeted about one ID uh, like a week or two ago, and, and they went down. Yeah. So yeah. it does. Yeah. People don't build sites. You know this. They don't build sites yeah. for the peak. They build them for the average. It's too expensive. Yeah, you, can't, you cannot afford to build them for the yeah. peak. Yeah. Yes. So when, you know, when we send 1,000 or 2,000 or 5,000 people to a site, of course it's going to – most sites will go down. Bye bye. Okay, so okay, let's step back. We've um, we've in the past created a perfect foundation of of knowledge about the way the internet works for understanding the problem with buffering. We understand that instead of a modem connection where you actually have the equivalent of wires from the sender to the receiver and you know exactly what the the bandwidth is because that's the you know the the baud rate of the modem or the 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 bandwidth of your point to point hardwired connection that's all gone now and 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 I remember describing how I mean what a conceptual leap it was in the in the minds of the original designers, the concept that you could you could create virtual connections, not actual physical connections, but the equivalent of a, 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 a virtual connection with the agreement between endpoints that they were connected by maintaining some state information, some knowledge at each end about the the condition and the history of their connection, and then having them just launch packets of data towards each other, which the intervening internet of routers would arrange to get to the other end. And I've also, I've talked about router buffers before in this context, where if you think of a router as like a star, like a hub with a bunch of connections coming out of it, going in, you know, north, south, east, west, and in other compass directions and packets are coming in on various of those connections to interfaces on the router then they go into the core routing core of the router which examines the IP address at the front of the packet and decides using its routing table which is the best interface to send the packet back out on so the timing of all of this is uncertain. These packets are arriving on all these different wires coming into the router whenever they want to, asynchronously, and it's having to sort of shuffle them around, look at them, and then s send them back out. But if by chance a bunch of packets came in on three lines that all wanted to go out on a fourth line, and assuming for a second that these lines were all the same speed, well, if if three came in, or, or if a bunch of packets came in from three lines, they can't all go out at once. They have to be lined up. So interfaces in buffers 
I'm mean, sorry, interfaces and routers have buffers. They have a staging area where packets can be placed to sort of deal with these little little brief events. The sort of the, the, just the need to the, the the need to deal with the fact in this as a consequence of this autonomous routing where we've just got packets flying all over in every direction. A consequence of that is that we need a we need some buffer. We need to deal with the sh with the possibility that there'll be moments where a connection is saturated and, and and where it's not so saturated that we have to throw things away because if we had no buffer then we would be we would be over discarding packets but one of the other weird consequences of this multi-link links between routers we've got links our wi-fi from our laptop on the couch to our to our um wi-fi router then uh, there there's a link to maybe our our dsl modem or our cable modem then there's then there's the cable link to the isp's network then it's then there's multiple routes through the isp then there's their link to the internet now we're on finally well, after all those links, we're on the core of the internet. So then we've got multiple major tier one providers, you know, like uh, Level Three, for example, and others that are major carriers, and they get the traffic over to another ISP, where through many links it gets back to its destination. So all of these links, probably, you know, almost without exception, they're running at different speeds. There's big, hefty, multi-gig fiber links. There's, there's gig E Ethernet links. There's 100 base T links. There's, there's, you know, who knows what between the cable modem or what, what, or what the cable modem is actually doing in terms of its connection. Then there's a link between it and your, and your Wi-Fi router. And then there's your Wi-Fi link. And we know that Wi-Fi, actual Wi-Fi performance varies greatly depending upon the, the signal strength and multi-path interference and, and various things that the Wi-Fi system is doing in order to, to make it work. So, so, I mean, it's just when you stand back and you look at this, it's amazing, <laughs> frankly, that any data gets anywhere at all. But what's significant is that there is no way to know what the bandwidth is because of all of these links and, and routers. That is, it's one thing to talk about buffering. You think about buffering as sort of, you know, short-term overage handling, where, where just in an instant, three packets can all want to go out one wire, and they've just got to line up a little bit. But if over time there was, if, if over time many input feeds were saturated that all wanted to go to one output feed that was no faster than than the inputs then more data would be coming into that router than it was possible for it to send out and so it would have no choice but to drop packets they just it, the, its buffer would fill and then no more could get in and so it it just wouldn't have they keep they keep coming in on the wire, but it, there's nowhere for it to put them. It can't can't get rid of them fast enough. So it's got to just discard them. And we've discussed this. That's the way. That's the genius of the original designers was that they said, okay, throw it out. Not all not all packets have to get there. Right. It's it it they they and they made peace with that, which had to have given them some <laughs> sleepless nights. But they said, okay, we're just going to make, I mean, that's like the, that's, that's the trade-off of a packet switching network is we can't guarantee that there's, go that you're going to be able to send as much as you want because other people could, could be competing with you on the same thoroughfare and it just, you can't get there. So you'll have to back off. You'll have to throttle back. And that is the genius of the TCP protocol. Remember that 
that we've, we've talked about the, the, the way TCP works. It starts off slowly, the so-called TCP slow start. When, when you initiate a connection to a remote server, your computer doesn't know how much bandwidth you've got. It doesn't know um, how fast it can send the data. So it starts sending it and hopes for the best. And as time goes by, it sends the data faster and faster and faster. What it's trying to do is it's trying to sense when the link gets saturated. And because of all these hops and all these links that may be running at different speeds and may have differing levels of congestion, we don't know where we're going to have a problem. But at some point along the way, there will be a situation where packets are lost. They may be lost due to a momentary surge where there's competing traffic, or they could be lost at any point, and this is a key concept, at any point where the bandwidth drops. Any point where you go from a high bandwidth flow to a reduced bandwidth, you're going to have a problem because... Up until then, you've been able to send packets at high speed. As soon as you drop to lower bandwidth, as we've seen, the, it, there, there will probably be a buffer of some sort there. So it'll be some device which is doing its, the best job it can, but you're just giving it more than it can send. So it has no choice but to discard something. So the brilliance of TCP is that it senses the loss of, of packets when the packets it's sending are not being acknowledged. When, it's, when it fails to get acknowledgement, it assumes packet loss. So it, it backs off. It slows down in order to sort of adjust to having hit the ceiling. Now, it doesn't know whether that was a, a, a fixed bandwidth limit that it hit and so that it should just stay where it is, or that it could have equally been a burst of, of, of congestion somewhere along the way that's gone now. So it always creeps back up. And so, so what TCP is always doing is sort of riding just under the ceiling of, of what it's able to establish, of, of the bandwidth. It's always trying to push a little, a little harder and when it gets the news back that, whoops, packets apparently have been dropped because it's not getting acknowledgments of their receipt from the far end, then it, it takes that as, oops, okay, I found the ceiling again, back off a little bit, and then it begins to creep forward. So, so that's been the solution. But what that depends upon is, is low latency. That is, that, that depends upon by its nature, that soon after it is soon after it's going too quickly, it receives notice that it's not. And I was trying to think, Leo, of uh, the best analogy, and I I got a great one that everyone can relate to, and we've all seen on newscasts how painful it is for two people to talk over a satellite delay, which is substantial. Yeah. Yeah, you see it um, on CNN all the time, this long yes, or, lag. Or, or bless his heart, Chris Matthews cannot shut up. And he... <laughs> it's so, it's on so, MSNBC, it, yeah. <laughs> you have he, to just he, stop talking. That's the only loves, way to handle it. Yes, well, what he does is worse. Because and I've watched this over and over and over. I, 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 you know, he'll he'll be talking to somebody, you know, in Iraq, and and then and, and the and the person's sitting there patiently waiting because Chris loves the sound of his own voice. Yeah. And so Chris finally ends with a question. Yeah. And then, just <laughs> as the other person hears the end of it, Chris thinks of a better question. Yeah. 
And so asks him, he's like amends that question oh. and, 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 and goes on. And so you see the other guy beginning to respond. And then he hears Chris change his mind about the question. It's, it's just like, oh, my God. Pain. Yeah, painful. Anyway, we, so the point is, what is that? That is two people, two entities trying to interact in a real-time fashion in the face of delay. That that latency, right? And it, it's you just can't do it. It is it, it creates a problem, and so what has happened is, over time, all of the specifications have been laid out beautifully. If you look at the RFCs, they like they they everything I've talked about is spelled out in detail. Nowhere, nowhere. Does it talk about the size of the buffers? Yeah, unfortunately. Never comes up. Yeah. Never did come up. Now, yeah. it used to be that RAM was expensive. So buffers were small because, no, because you know, even Cisco making big iron routers, they, you know, they were trying to get as much profit margin as they could. And hardware was expensive 15 years ago, 20 years ago. So... The buffers were small. And also, these were the engineers who designed the Internet. They knew that packets were supposed to be dropped. And that's, that's you know, I've said it in our original tutorial series on how the Internet works. That's the genius of packet routing is, oh, well, packet got dropped. We couldn't get it there. And all the protocols have been designed with that in mind. TCP sets its speed, assuming that a, a immediately after the, the bandwidth is hit, it will get a notification that lets it back off. But now what happened? Everything got cheap. Chips get big. RAM, huge amounts of RAM is built into the 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 arm processors just because why not you know we 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 keep making the the die sizes larger and the and the um the uh de the de details we're able to to imprint on the chips are are becoming uh ever smaller we're able to increase the transistor count dramatically so being able to say oh you know this thing's got 256 megs of ram well, it doesn't cost anything. And so the router vendors, really, who are not the Internet engineers that, that founded Cisco and, and, and Jupiter and the, you know, the major backbone providers of, of the Internet, they're thinking, hey, we can have larger buffers. And then packets won't get dropped. Won't that be wonderful? Well, turns out the answer is no. That's really bad mm. because what happens is it is often at the client router, at the end user router, that we have the biggest drop in bandwidth. That is where we go from large bandwidth pipes to a restricted bandwidth. And if, if this router has large buffers... And now we're talking, I mean, they, they could be, and in fact, in some they are megabytes because the RAM is there. It's free. It's on the chip, you know, and it would take a certain amount of self-control for the designer to say, I'm only going to use uh, 10K when he's got a meg. And when he thinks, oh, you know, not understanding this, thinking that dropping packets is bad. Turns out, no. Dropping packets is really important. It's the only way that TCP knows how fast it can go. And if you, if you, if you allow TCP to keep going faster, it will fill this huge buffer. And only when this huge buffer is full will packets start getting dropped. The problem is that, remember that the, it's the acknowledgement of unreceived packets, which is, or I'm sorry, it's the non-acknowledgement 
of uh, the, the non-acknowledgement of packets that were not received that tells TCP to stop. So what happens? TCP keeps filling this buffer, which then goes into a, a, a it drops in bandwidth. There's a constraint before it gets to the end point. Well, the end point is happy because it's still getting data from the buffer. So it's continuing to acknowledge the, the, the correct receipt of, of the packets incoming, which continues to encourage the sender to not only keep sending them, but to send them faster. So this buffer continues to fill. It starts even filling up faster now because, because due to its depth, the recipient is still getting data from this big buffer and acknowledging. So the sender keeps cranking it forward. So what ends up happening is the we end up, as a consequence of this delay, we end up delaying the news to the sender that a long time ago we hit our bandwidth limit. Well, what TCP does is it only it backs off by a percentage. It assumes timely notification. So if you put a big buffer there, it backs off by a percentage of what it was sending. But the buffer has been so big that it has gone way beyond the recipient's actual ability to receive. So even backing off a bit doesn't solve the problem. It's still going too fast. And then it backs off again, and it's still going too fast. And again, and it's still going too fast. So you end up with this big problem caused by a, 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 a buffer which is too deep. Now the other thing that happens is, is, is the phenomenon that people see at home. And this is what, what got Jim Geddes, who is the person a year and a half ago who, who, who got onto this problem. He noticed that interactive gaming came to a standstill when, when he was downloading a file. Or, no, I think he was uploading a file, actually. So th the idea was that, that he was uploading a file and even the reverse direction had a problem. Well, the reason that happens is no notice that we've got data for, for, for a TCP. Acknowledgements have to go back also. So if you've got a buffer, a, a large, you know, MAG buffer, which is full to the brim, then f f carrying one flow of traffic, then what's happened is you've introduced a delay. You may not care if you're, if, you know, the movie you're downloading to watch later isn't, it, you know, that you don't care about the real-time performance of that, but you care about the real-time performance of web surfing where where in, inherently you're, you're getting a page, that page comes in, and you're wanting to send off, set up a whole bunch of new connections to all the other places that this page needs to be built from. And so the web page is highly interactive. But if you've got your router buffer, a, 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 an overly large router, which has been allowed to fill up with traffic from, from a download going on, Suddenly now, other traffic is stuck at the end of it. If it can even get in, it may be discarded prematurely because this buffer's full with someone else's work. And even if it wasn't, we require the, the, the assumption on the Internet is a round trip time on the order of 100 milliseconds. 100 milliseconds is, is you know, out and back is is sort of that was the target that these protocols were designed around and maybe it's 200 maybe it's 150 one, 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 156 i'm i'm looking at at my own round trip um and i'm seeing a uh looks like about 60 milliseconds between here and grc and i'm actually going up to northern california before i jump onto level 3 and come back to to grc's servers 
Um, and I see a worst case of about 158 milliseconds. And, you know, that's what ping shows you when you ping something. So you could, you know, use the ping command to ping Google or ping Microsoft or ping Yahoo and get a sense for what your round trip time is. But, you know, it's relatively fast. And, and web surfing, you know, interactive use depends upon that kind of performance, that kind of speed. So if, if we have a large buffer in our router... As long as it's empty, we're fine. We'll get good interactive performance. But as soon as it fills up, if it's ever allowed to, to fill up, that large buffer that bu large buffer equals delay if it's full. And, and then all, I mean, then, you know, quote, the Internet is slow is what everyone else in the family starts saying, even if... Even if there's like ample bandwidth, you got you you could have, um, you know, a hundred meg down and one meg up. Yet if you saturate that one meg up, sending a file out, for example, nothing can come back because the protocols have to have acknowledgments get back in a timely fashion, and even even saturating your outbound buffer keeps your incoming data from from being able to be acknowledged. So so this 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 problem we got into unintentionally with router manufacturers just sort of thinking they were doing the right thing turns out to be really more trouble than it's worth. Notice that notice that that big file you're sending cannot get to you any faster than the slowest bandwidth link. It can't. Nothing can squeeze it through. So having that big buffer sitting there tr trying to squeeze it through doesn't get it there any faster. If the buffer were only 10K so that it's only eight or nine packets, then it, 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 that doesn't mean it's going to go slower. What that means is that little buffer will overflow immediately and an acknowledgement will be sent back telling the sender back off a little bit and then the buffer will, will, will clear up. But that also, that little buffer will allow all the other things going on in the household to stay interactive even when a big file is being downloaded. And that's the key. These large buffers allow large download traffic to, to block interactivity. Um, and in, in many situations, that's a deal killer. You know, you don't want that. And it doesn't mean, it doesn't help the, the bigger traffic to go faster. Due to this weirdness of the way packets are moved around the internet, it's, it's not going to go faster than, than, than it needs to through the, through the slowest link you've got. And, and you're much better served only buffering just enough to deal with transients, not, and, and, and it doesn't make any sense to buffer larger than that because it, it breaks our signaling. Okay, so there is this netalizer. I'm sure everyone listening is now wondering, oh my God, what's the situation <laughs> with, with my network? I've run it nope. here and at home already. <laughs> very, <laughs> I was very curious. This is a neat thing. It's, I guess this is something they're doing at Berkeley as part of a large scale study. So uh, not only is it a great service for us, but by using it, you're helping them co collect data about network in general. Yes, exactly. Um, they 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 do um, they do some aggregate record keeping by IP, so they're able to see that these ISPs are doing this and those right. ISPs are doing that, and they all they also collect without IP just overall general operation. So I ran it on myself, and remember that I've got a pair of T1 trunks. Uh, they each go at 1.54 megabits, and they're bonded together, so I get the, the sum of their bandwidth. So sure enough, this, this thing said, for me, network bandwidth, upload 2.9 megabits per second, download 2.9 megabits that's per what, second. That's what you'd expect. Exactly. I mean, I was very impressed that they just they nailed that. And they said, your uplink, we measured your uplink sending bandwidth at 2.9 megabits per sec. It says, this level of bandwidth works well for, for many users. 
During this test, the applet observed 1,551 reordered packets. Now, that's actually a high number, but it, that's a consequence of the fact that I have two T1s. So, so, so normally you wouldn't see that high a reordering count, but it's because my two T1s are, you know, packets are going across either one and they might be coming out in, in a different sequence. Then they said, during, uh, then they said, your download link, we measured your download link's receiving bandwidth at 2.9 megabits per second. This level of bandwidth works, works well for many users. During this test, the applet observed 696 reordered packets. Now, that sounds like network, a lot. Oh, it is because of, and it is because of my two T1s. But so again, this it, is you know, why your Skype sucks, by the way. <laughs> well, it may not be the only reason because keep going. Okay. Network buffer measurements. Uplink, 940 milliseconds. That's a lot. Well, but remember, only if the buffer's full. But so, so what this, so yes, uplink is almost a second, 940 milliseconds. That is a large, that is a large uplink buffer. Right. And then downlink, 370 milliseconds. That's not so bad. So they say, we estimate your uplink as having 940 milliseconds of buffering. This level can in some situations prove somewhat high, and you may experience degraded performance when performing interactive tasks such as web surfing while simultaneously conducting large uploads. Uh. Real-time applications such as games or audio chat may also work poorly yes. when conducting large uploads at the same time. So it's, not, it's okay um, as long as you're not doing other things? Exactly. Okay. Yes, it, it's only... See, the, the buffer... You, the buffer only inter, only introduces a delay when it's full. If the buffer is just uh, you know cruising along, packets come in one or two, and they immediately leave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then it's not introducing any delay. We do we do have some of the worst Skype from you, and it's really should be the best. And I do suspect now is that a route? Is that your router buffer that delay, or is that? A T uh, a, a T one artifact. Yeah, I don't know. Um, Cause I'm you know, looking. Mike, uh, let me look at mine. We have ETH, EFM Ethernet to the first mile on the on this computer, and it's showing network buffer of uplink 110 milliseconds, very low. Nice. And then it doesn't even. It says downlink is good. It's not giving me any details on that. Huh. Um. I don't know why. Uh, we were not able to produce enough traffic to load the downlink buffer. Or the downlink buffer is particularly small, which was what we would like, right? Yeah. Now, and, and see, and that 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 exactly speaks to my point. They were the the way they were able to determine my uplink bandwidth was by jet by specifically generating enough traffic to overflow it. Right. And so, and that's what it took was like figuring out how much traffic you know generating enough traffic to overflow it, um, and um. Um, because, you know, le le lesser traffic than that won't, you know, the, the buffering is not a problem. Now, at home, I'm on Comcast. Uh, yeah. This is my home computer, and uh, it's running an Apple router, and it's considerably worse. Uh, the speeds are better. The upload is 5 megabits, download 20 megabits, greater than 20 megabits, but the uplink is 260 milliseconds, and the downlink is 98 milliseconds. Well, so that's, still, huh? good. it's still good compared to me. Yeah, I th what is the what what router do you use? I have a Cisco 3400. I mean, I've got a big iron router. Huh. No, I mean not 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 a Cisco plastic box. No, no, Cisco... no, the high end one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Isn't that interesting? Well, your but your numbers are are uh, wouldn't you say they're less than uh, optimal? I'll do some poking around. Well, I just ran this an hour ago, so I think this is yeah. fascinating. So yeah, you it's... look at the network access link properties, right? That's the section that you want to look at. Is that yes, right? and yes. and it's it's network buffer measurements is is what it says. And is that is is that directly related to the router, or could there be other? Well, see, yes, that's the problem, and and that's what I, that's why I'm I'm saying I don't know yet. I haven't right. had a chance to research this because this is buffering somewhere between me and them. Right. So it doesn't. It's not necessarily my buffers. It could be. You know, cogent. The, my my T one provider could be could have their system misconfigured, and see that's the other reason. I don't know why these are different. Why uplink and downlink are different? Because my my router is doing nothing. It's just sitting here 
um, uh, directly sending stuff out of my uh, up my up my T1 lines. There's I see no reason that there should be anything asymmetric. Notice that my bandwidth was exactly 2.9 right, right. in each direction. So it may not be me that's doing the buffering. It could be cogent that's doing the buffering, mm-hmm. and so it's not it's not within my control. Now, some you can imagine buffering is important enough that a lot of a thought a lot of thought has gone into this. The typical brain dead buffer is a simple FIFO that we've talked about, a first in, first out, and so the overflow behavior of a FIFO buffer is is called tail drop, meaning that it just drops the packet from the tail of the buffer. It no more will fit in, so it discards it. But because a lot of work has gone into this, um, engineers have said, "Okay, how can we? How can we? You know, yes, losing packets, dropping packets, is the nature of the internet. It's going to happen. How can we make it smarter? For example." How can we be more fair about competing traffic? If, you know, one high bandwidth user should not be allowed to fill and saturate the buffer because then an interactive user who would like to have, you know, doesn't need that much bandwidth. And if we could just sneak him in a little bit, then he could be happy with his low bandwidth interactivity while the big transfer goes on in the background. The problem is that requires extreme knowledge of the nature of the flows, and routers don't have that. Routers just see packets coming in, and they go, okay, fine, you know, and, and trying to send it out to, to, to the, the best direction it can. But a, a, a technology was developed called random early detection, RED. What random early detection does is as the buffer is beginning to fill. Not once it's filled and we have to drop things off the tail, but as it fills, the, st- the, the router increases the, st- the statistical likelihood of discarding a packet even that it doesn't that it has room for. It just says, you know, the buffers are beginning to fill up. Let's, you know, let's just toss this one out. Because tossing them out, as we know, is a healthy thing to do on the Internet. And as the buffer continues to fill, it increases the likelihood of tossing packets out. And what this means is that if somebody was greedy with their particular flow, the likelihood of their packets being tossed out statistically is greater than the likelihood of somebody who's not using that many packets having theirs tossed out. So it, it, it tends to throttle the, the people who, are, who, are, who have more packets in the buffer and not so much those that, that don't have that many packets in the buffer. And the idea being that theoretically you never get to a point of actually saturating the entire buffer because you've ex- you exponentially increase the probability of discarding packets as it continues to fill. And, and the beauty of that is, for example, that allows TCP to get an early notice. Ooh, and I forgot about one other horrible thing that happens. Um, <laughs> if you've got, remember I was, when I was talking about how the, a big buffer gets full and then TCP keeps sending and increasing its speed because it doesn't know any better because the receiver is still getting valid packets and acknowledging them from this big buffer... The, uh, one other thing that happens is called TCP global synchronization. If multiple TCP flows are going through, then what happens is they the, all of their traffic begins to stall at the same time, Then, but none of them get the notice. They all get over-ramped. Then finally they all shut down. And what can happen is, as a, as, as a consequence of this is all of the TCP connections can, can essentially synchronize. So rather than you'd like them to, all, to be hitting the, their ceilings at different times so that, so that they're backing off and scaling and sort of cohabitating nicely. But if you end up with a big buffer, the, the phenomenon of the way TCP backs off is 
they can end up falling into sync. And this has been something that's been seen in routers on the Internet where there's like this surge and then stop and surge and then stop. And, and you sort of get into this oscillating positive feedback uh, phenomenon, which is really bad. Because, I mean, it's just like, you know, every, it starts to really break the Internet. So the good news is that, that attention is being paid to this. There isn't, this hasn't really, I, I don't think it's reached critical mass yet where router manufacturers are acknowledging it. But as you'd expect, the open WRT people are. There is a, there is a site called bufferbloat.net where, which is where the, there's been a concentration of, of work. There is a, a variant of the Open WRT project called Ciro, C E R O W R T, which is a, now at beta two, and they're only supporting one of the more popular Netgear, I think it is. I want to say N600, but I'm not sure. I just from memory, I didn't write this down. Um, but so th- we are beginning to see some some firmware for Open WRT class routers which um they're using the latest linux kernel the the i think it's 3.3 um typically routers i think are back on 2.6 point something for their firmware um this project is using the latest linux kernel because linux is experimenting um with with the buffer bloat problem and in in the 3.3 kernel they've got something called bql which is a byte queue limit they limit the number of bytes in the queue rather than the limit than, than the number of packets. You using um, uh, a rather sophisticated strategy and something called SSSFQRED, which is sto- <laughs> cha- stochastic, stochastic. Fair, <laughs> yes, stochastic fair queuing random early drop. Oh, that's an acronym. Acronym. Yes. <laughs> um, so. Um, anyway, that's where we stand. Um, there, I expect that in the future, in the advanced configuration pages of the better Soho routers, we will see configuration settings that allow smart homeowners good, good. to 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 introduce smarter buffer management and probably reduce manually reduce the buffer size. I read an interesting dialogue among these engineers that were explaining that there's a problem, and that is that if a if a router manufacturer deliberately used smaller buffers, then then competitors with large buffers could could claim that the better router was inferior because it dropped more packets and had smaller buffers and unwitting users would go, oh, well, that sounds like I don't want that router, when in fact, it would give you much better performance right, right. on your network. Well, I'm glad to know so, that it's software uh, configurable. I mean, you know, in other words, you could use a custom yes. firmware and fix it. It's not that it's not even though the hardware has the the RAM, you can you can reduce it. Oh, yeah. You just tell no, don't use so much. Yeah. And in fact, it turns out even that the, there are even device drivers. The, this Linux 3.3 has improved device drivers because, again, RAM got so cheap and, and there's so much RAM in our PCs that our, our own network adapters have, over, have, <laughs> have too much buffers down in, down in the kernel, wow. down in the driver. Jeez, Louise. Because it's like, well, we got RAM. You know, we, don't, we don't want to throw these packets away when, in fact, you'd like to. And I did see one interesting comment on a um, in a in a dialogue where someone said, "Well, that there's there's a problem with sending out lots of little bursts, and be, which is what you have to do if you have small buffers, because for power conser- conservation, having a large transmit queue allows the the processor, like in a smartphone, to put a whole bunch of data into the queue and then." sleep itself oh. shut 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 itself down so that a lower power portion of the chip is able to go and send off that data 
and the and the CPU is not consuming so much power. Hmm. Whereas if you had much smaller buffers, it would have to be constantly waking up and shutting down um, much more rapidly. And so as a as a percentage, you end up you know uh, being alive longer than if you were able to shut down for a long period of time. Right. So that's I mean we've it, there's a lot to be determined yet, but uh, that's the story of buffer bloat. And uh, when is the optimal buffer size? Can you say that? And that's just it. There isn't one. Right. It's so confounding because we it's a function of round trip time and bandwidth and speed and usage characteristics. Right. There just there is no optimum. But what's happened is we know that too big is really bad. Right. And, you know, too small that you, you want it enough to deal with transients. Yet you still want the total round trip time. Uh, and see, this is it. If you just do a ping, a ping will give you your no buffer delay right. round trip time. Right. Because it's such so, a small amount of data. Yes. So do this ping Google and see what that is. Yeah. Then, then start downloading a podcast from twit.tv and ping again. And oh, and you have to you have, also have to wait a bit. You have to wait for the buffer to fill. So right. so wait a while, or 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 just go ahead and start pinging. And what you will Watch probably it go see, down. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And so you will begin to see the round trip time increasing, not because you're getting further away from Google, but because the buffers are filling, and and your ping is having to wait in line wade through that buffer to get to the front before it can finally leave and the same thing happens in reverse. Right. So it's it's not unfilled buffers that are the problem. The buffers themselves are not the problem. It's that they're allowed to be to get too deep and that creates latency and our the internet was not designed it was designed for on the order of a hundred milliseconds of latency. Not I mean I've seen some reports of six second Six second buffers. That's not good. Buffers that are six seconds deep. Now you might as well just you know forget <laughs> hang it. Hang up. Go home. Yes. By the way, this uh, netalizer gives you a lot of other interesting information. Oh, it's a fantastic I mean, application. I'm looking it's worth at, uh, certain TCP protocols are blocked in outbound traffic. Not all DNS types are correctly processed. I mean, there's a lot of diagnostic information in here. Yes. This is uh, my home router, which of course has some sort of something going on. Um, probably Comcast. It's blocking remote SMB servers. Well, that's probably right. Yeah, uh, I'm yeah. sure it would be. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but I have to say, Russell, our IT guy here, is so good that our our, our router is well configured uh, here at the uh, studio for minimal. I mean, he's done a he's done a great job for minimal latency, great speed. Um, that's why we get uh, we get such good results. But Steve, I want you to look at your router. You're getting too many packet reordering. <laughs> too much of that. <laughs> uh, if you want to know more about this show, he's silent. But you know, we do. Uh, it's funny. We have, uh, given that you have such a rock solid setup, it always puzzles me that we have s occasional audio breakups with you. Sometimes uh, okay. weird results. But what with I will you. do is, I I will for our next podcast next week, I will shut down. One of my T ones, ah, because because what what did you see by the way for packet reordering? Zero, really? Yeah, interesting. And you're right. Um, I don't know how Skype handles reordering. If it's buffering, if it sees them out of order at all, it might just drop uh, anything that's not coming along. Anyway, I'll shut down a T one, and we'll try a podcast next week with only one T one. I can do it trivially, so it's not not a problem at all. Yeah, yeah, that would be that might be. You know, it's funny, but this is a perfect example. Less. Sometimes is more. More sometimes is less. <laughs> Actually, I'm sorry. I had 10 reordered packets. Uh, wait a minute. Which, which? Okay, now I have this. Yeah, no, but I had nine. That was at home. Had... 10 was at home. Let me see uh, on the uh, Oh, system. and I had 1,551. Yeah, we had no reordering uh, here in the studio, and I had 10 wow. reorders at, uh, at home. Wow. Yeah. So I'm thinking so yes. that that's the that's the dual T ones. Maybe just yeah, let's disable it next time. When, yep, yep. Because you have plenty. One one point four megabits up is plenty for Skype. Yep, that's that's. I will sure. I will shut one down and we'll see how it does. Steve is the master, and you can find out more by going to his website grc.com. That's where you'll get, of course, 
Uh, so the uh, fantastic spin right world's finest hard drive maintenance and recovery utility you'll also get all this free doohickeys the security stuff and copies of the podcast 16 kilobit uh, audio and transcriptions uh that those are only available at grc.com next week a feedback episode so while you're there if you've got a question uh, just leave a question at grc.com slash feedback and uh, otherwise if you want the video or the high quality audio or uh you just want to subscribe, you can do that at twit.tv. We do this show live every Wednesday, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 1800 UTC. So stop by and watch live. Always fun. Then we can wa- you can watch the chat room as it, as it does its tests and brings Netalizer down. It's fun. <laughs> it's fun. And it's been fun watching. There's such a wide variety. We have uh, somebody in, in Britain who's got amazing bandwidth. 25 pounds for a BT Infinity. And he's he's just got uh, you know forty five megabits up and down or something like that. It's incredible. Wow, it's incredible. But there is a wide variety of ping times. We've got people with nineteen hundred millisecond ping times. And, I mean, ooh, there's okay. That's two seconds. That's too much buffering. <laughs> yep. <laughs> wow. Yeah. What a great subject. And more to come, I'm sure, on this one. Steve, yep. thank you so much. Thanks, Leo. We'll see you next week on Security Now. Security.